I want to thank Young America's Foundation. I want to thank the, the campus chapter that brought me out because obviously they did yeoman's work in doing so. I feel bad that we didn't have a bigger venue. Apparently there were a couple thousand more people who wanted to come. Uh, I am grateful for all of the hard work, specifically, of the University Police Department. So thank you to them. It is the police who, as I have said, are that dividing line between civilization and barbarism. And the reason that we can hold events like this is because there are people who are willing to stand in the line of fire so that I can stand here and talk to you. And it's pathetic that we actually need to have that on a college campus, that we need to have scores of police officers protecting us from people who might get violent. I'm not talking about people who protest. As was just said, those people are exercising their First Amendment rights. That's great. You know, they want to go out and they want to protest. That's great. It would be better if they would come inside and have a discussion with me. And I'd prefer that they would come and ask questions and we could talk together. But if they're not going to do that, then let them protest outside. But the idea that I need to now have big security teams follow me around. I mean, look, I'm ripped, but I'm not that physically imposing. <laughs> I mean, here were just some of the security arrangements today, according to the university. Much of the surrounding area will be blocked off, and faculty had the option of relocating their classes to other buildings. There would be significant police presence in that area, as well as President Circle, to protect both those protesting and attending the event. I doubt that the people attending the event were really the threat here. To promote safety and help ensure orderly conduct, no masks, bandanas, or other face coverings were permitted on campus. Why? Because there were radical groups from both on campus and off who were threatening violence and attempting to shut this event down and bragging about how they were going to attempt to do so. The nice thing is that here in Utah, apparently, even the, the would-be rebels are blabbermouthed. And so they like to talk a lot about what they're going to do and the way they're going to do it. And they like to talk a lot about why they're doing it as well. So I really did appreciate this letter that appeared in the Salt Lake Tribune, courtesy of one Ian Decker. <laughs> of Students for a Democratic Society, which, I, frankly, I didn't even know that it existed. Like, is Tom Hayden still alive? Uh, <laughs> Apparently, he's also representing Black Lives Matter and uh, University of Utah Metro. This fellow, and I assume he's a fellow because I, I want to be very careful, I understand the sensitivities around misgendering, uh, seems like a total delight. I, it seems like a total delight. Here's the letter that Ian Decker issued on behalf of these groups. We have no shame in saying that we intend to shut down Ben Shapiro. Right, because you're stupid. This is not a decision... <laughs> This is not a decision we came to based on youthful emotions or out of some desire for the world to be one big safe space. This decision was arrived at based on a real, material understanding of the political environment of Utah and the material effects of an emboldened far right. As an example, Utah is already a state with a homelessness and suicide crisis among LGBTQ youth. Ben Shapiro has openly called transgender people mentally ill. He portrays the gay rights movement as a conspiracy to root out God-based institutions. He has recently defended conversion therapy, which is nothing short of abuse. So here's a litany of stupidity. Uh, number one, the idea that I am responsible for violence against LGBTQ people is delusional. It is fully delusional. I am perhaps the foremost anti-violent speaker on college campuses in America today. Violence is unacceptable under any circumstances. The state has a monopoly on legal violence unless you are reacting in self-defense. That's the beginning. Okay. This notion, by the way, that if I suggest that transgender people are suffering from a mental illness or mental disorder is fully in line with the DSM-4 as well as the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual governing how psychiatrists actually diagnose illness. As far as the notion that I portray the gay rights movement as a conspiracy to root out God-based institutions, I don't know where this guy's pulling this from. Uh, what I have said is that if there are members of the radical gay rights movement who suggest that my synagogue should be forced to perform a same-sex marriage, or that my business should be forced to cater a same-sex wedding, that is obviously an attempt to root out God-based institutions. Clearly. <laughs> this notion that I've recently defended conversion therapy, again, I don't know where this comes from. I, to my knowledge, I don't think I've ever actually defended conversion therapy. What I have suggested is that parents, in consultation with their children, have the right to go to psychiatrists to see psychiatrists for any treatment they choose. It's a free country. That's all. You know, I don't, I don't see any real good sociological data that suggests that conversion therapy is effective, or even that you should do it. But, as a parent, it is my responsibility how I want to raise my child, and anyone who gets between me, including the state, needs to move to the side. 
Okay. Also, it says, these are all positions he has stated in naked terms in articles he's written himself, which is clearly not true. To pretend that Shapiro does not spew racist and transphobic pseudoscience with the desire to justify and encourage violence is idealistic, ahistorical, and wrong. So this is where they get down to the nub of it, right? This is where Ian Decker gets down to the nub of it. Uh, number one, I would suggest that the greatest form of pseudoscience today on the public scene is suggesting that a man can magically become a woman. So when I say that, that is, if that's trans, transphobic pseudoscience, someone might want to pick up, I don't know, like a, fi a fifth grade biology textbook. Um, but the notion that this is a desire to justify and encourage violence, when I was at Berkeley, there was a group outside the venue, and they were chanting, speech is violence. And they're chanting this over and over, speech is violence which, again, is idiotic, because that's why it's called speech. Like, if it were violence, it would be called violence. Right? Speech is speech, and violence is violence, and unless the speech is overtly calling for violence, the speech is not linked with the violence. But the idea that if I say something you find offensive, that this is somehow promulgation of violence across the country is merely an excuse for people to get violent against the people with whom they disagree. That is ideological fascism at work under the guise of a smiling, happy face. And says, we intend on shutting down Ben Shapiro precisely because we don't live in a fantasy world where hate speech has no consequences. We believe his hate speech can and will have material consequences for vulnerable, pe vulnerable people. Again, if you can name one person, one, in America who has been physically harmed because of my speech, I dare you to find them and show them to me. One. Okay, and I'm not talking about my three and a half year olds who I had to deprive of ice cream yesterday. I'm talking about someone else. They say this will not be a violent protest, but we intend to exercise our free speech in the boldest and most unapologetic way we can, even if Shapiro, his fans, and the university police would have it otherwise. Again, I would not have it otherwise that you're outside making fools of yourself. It's great for the cameras, and it just demonstrates that you have no clue what you're talking about. Okay, so now for the actually offensive part of the speech. Okay. <laughs> Here's the part that the left seems to find so all-fired offensive lately when I talk. You are not a victim. They are not victims. In America, unless you can show me why you are a victim, I am not willing to call you a victim. The idea that America is a terrible, racist, sexist, bigoted, homophobic place that seeks to stop you from pursuing your dreams is utter and complete nonsense. It is utter nonsense. This is America. Hey, you're essentially free to do what you want. That is reality. Freedom is harsh. Freedom is unsparing. It means that you're responsible for your own decisions. And listen, I'm willing to stand next to you again. If you can show me an instance of someone trying to stop you through racism, sexism, bigotry, homophobia, if you're willing to show me that instance, I'll stand next to you and fight it. But if it's just you blaming your life problems on some ghost out there, if it's you just suggesting that the milieu in which you live is the worst place on earth, let me suggest you visit anywhere else. Okay, so. And when I say this, people on the left for some reason find this non-empowering. To me, this is the most empowering thing that anyone can say to you, is your life is your own and it's your decision what to do with it. That you get to make the decisions that make your life better. And this is the basic conservative worldview. You're an individual, no one has to give you anything, but no one's going to get in your way. And it's our job to make sure that people don't get in your way. That is the basic constitutional worldview. That is the viewpoint of the founders of this country, which is why this is the greatest country in world history. The left doesn't believe this, however. The left doesn't believe that you're an individual. The left believes in intersectionality, the idea that you are a member of a group. The left believes in a hierarchy of victimhood. We can tell how much you've been victimized by looking at the color of your skin. We can tell how much you have been victimized by looking at your place of birth. We can tell how much you've been victimized by the kind of clothes you wear. Okay, this is nonsense. But what it does do is it's pretty popular on college campuses because it removes the requirement for you to make good decisions with your life. If you fail, if you suck at life, you don't have to blame you. You can blame everybody else, which is super duper convenient. Now, the way this works is that you form a coalition of people who all believe that their problems are caused by the United States more broadly, and politically speaking, the people who benefit from this are political and media elites who then use that as an excuse to tear down the system itself. The system is so bad, right? You're a black person. You know the system is bad. Join with me, a gay person who knows the system is bad. Join with me, a Latino person who knows the system is bad. We'll tear down the system and we'll build up a big government system in its place. This is why the left likes to use intersectionality. It's a substitution of identity politics warfare for class warfare. Now, in order to make this work, they have to have a hierarchy because not everyone can be equally victimized. So what they do is they break everybody down into groups and they decide that your opinion is only valuable if you are a leftist member of these groups. And we can decide whether your opinion is more or less valuable depending on which group you belong to. So, 
The hierarchy of victimhood goes something like this. If you're LGBT, Q, then we suggest that you are at the very top of the victimhood hierarchy. You have been most victimized in the United States, and therefore your opinion must be taken with the most gravitas. After that, we get to black folks. Black folks have been historically victimized in the United States, which of course is true, but the idea that every black person now is being individually victimized by the United States is not true. But they go back to the history, and then they say, okay, black people have been super victimized. That means if you're black, your opinion is worth more, and no one can challenge your politics without also challenging your identity. So it goes LGBTQ, and then black folks, and then Hispanic folks, and then women, and then Jews, and then Asians, and then way down at the bottom, white straight males. Right? Those are the people who are at the very bottom, and, and their, their opinions do not matter at all. Because those are people who are beneficiaries of the system, right? They don't get to talk about the system, because they're the ones who built the system. They're the ones for whom the system was created. America was built in order to benefit rich, white, straight males. And ever since, it's been benefiting rich, white, straight males. And so they don't have anything to say until they acknowledge their white privilege. And if they do acknowledge their white privilege, they still can't say anything unless it's just mimicking what other people say. That's the best way to acknowledge white privilege. If you're a white ally, you'll shut the hell up. Right? That's the idea here. You can even see this. There's an Antifa, uh, an Antifa video that was going around the internet over the past couple of weeks. It's really hilarious. It's, an, it's, a, it's a, what appears to be a Latina Antifa woman talking to this gangly white Antifa nerd and, uh, and telling him that he, ha he should shut up and punch a Nazi. He should not talk. He should just punch a Nazi. Because if he talks, then he's demonstrating his white privilege. But if he punches a Nazi, then he's a real ally. <laughs> and that's, how this, that's how this logic goes. There's one problem with this. None of this is true. This notion of this hierarchy of victims, that everybody in the United States is treated by group identity by the system itself. Of course, of course, of course, I say this every speech, and people on the left constantly ignore it. Of course, American history is replete with racism and sexism and bigotry and homophobia. Of course, that is true. And of course, some people are affected by the after effects of these things. Right? If you grew up in a community that suffered under Jim Crow, it's possible that you have less familial wealth passed down generation to generation. Of course that's true. You'd be a fool to deny that. That's not the same thing as saying that you get to affect injustice today in order to correct injustices in the past. You do not get to harm people who have never harmed you because somebody's dad once harmed your dad. That's not how justice works. That is injustice. And it's also not true, by the way, that America is a place where nobody can change their circumstance. America is a place where everybody can change their circumstance. This notion that America was created specifically for the benefit of rich white males to preserve their power. Absolute, utter hogwash. Just, just complete bull. The way that you know this is complete bull is because the highest single earning group, average family, is Asians. The Constitution, last I checked, was not written in Korean by a bunch of straight Korean males <laughs> who wrote the Constitution specifically to preserve their own place at the top of the Asian-dominated American hierarchy. But the fact is that there is tremendous mobility in American society. This is the American dream is this mobility, and that still exists. So now I'm going to explain why, if you're a member of particular groups, you're not a victim. So I'm not just going to leave it at telling you you're not a victim. I'm going to explain why you're not a victim. Okay, let's start with uh, black folks in the United States. Are you inherently victimized because you're black in the United States? So again, for the second time, slavery, Jim Crow, evil, no excuses, of course. And of course those have historical after effects. That is not the same thing as saying that people who are living in bad circumstances today are doing so because the system today is unfair. That is not the same thing at all. I require that when I have a political conversation with somebody that they prescribe a solution. Okay, it just can't be whining about the circumstances of America. I need a solution because usually the whining doesn't even boil down to evidence. It boils down to America is racist, therefore support my program. And if you don't support my program, it's because you're a racist too. That's not an argument, that's an emotional appeal. And it's nasty and it's vicious. Because the implication is that you're a racist if you disagree with them, which is garbage. So, let's talk about the income, income gap between black folks and white folks in the United States. Again, it is true. Familial wealth two generations ago, there was a big gap between black folks and white folks. And that gap exists today. Is that entirely due, or even largely due, or even mostly due to historic injustices, the lack of income mobility in large swaths of the black community? No, it isn't. Income mobility still exists. According to the Brookings Institute, a left-leaning institute, 2% of Americans who follow these three simple rules are in permanent poverty. Only 2%. The other 90% of 98% of Americans who follow these three simple rules will not live in permanent poverty in the United States. Get married before you have babies, finish high school, get a job. That's it. Those are the three simple rules. Okay, I don't think that it's asking too much to suggest that we are all capable of doing these things. High schools around the United States suck. 
If you can write your name, you're going to finish high school in the United States. <laughs> Getting a job. Jobs are widely available. They may not be the kind of work you want to do. It may not be at the wage that you want to accept, but you can get a job. There are people out there who are seeking people to get jobs. And then, notice the Booking Inst Institute doesn't say a job where you're happy and satisfied. It doesn't say you have to have a job as a beat poet. Right? It says that you have to get a job. If you hold down a job and you finish high school, and then finally, if you don't have a baby before you're married. And again, I think everyone is capable of this. It's so weird to me. People on the left, whenever I say this, they go, well, that's, that's just discriminatory for you to say that people aren't capable of this. That's discriminatory. Just don't put that thing in that place without that thing on it. What is this? <laughs> this is not difficult. Seventy-five percent of Americans who have followed these three simple rules and started off in the lowest quintile in America's economy have moved into the middle class. Seventy-five percent. Single motherhood is the single greatest predictor of intergenerational poverty, not race, not race. Seventy-one percent of poor families in the United States overall have children without being married. The poverty rate among non-married white families was about 22 percent as of 2008. The poverty rate among black married couples that same year, seven percent. What happened to the white privilege? What happened to the white privilege? Why is it that white unmarried mothers aren't richer than black married families? Because the problem isn't the color, the problem is the lack of marriage, obviously. Okay, how about, how about crime? There's this notion that the police are systemically racist. They're going around just arresting black people willy-nilly so that they can fill the prisons with black people for no reason other than they hate black people. Okay, nonsense. Not true. Not true. You know what's a really easy way not to end up in jail? Do not commit a crime. A really easy way not to end up in jail. Statistically speaking, felonies are under-prosecuted in the black community. Police are less likely to kill black people than white people in similar shooting circumstances. As of this year, people who are talking about the police going out willy-nilly shooting people, you know, kneeling in front of the, you know, for the national anthem in front of the American flag because of the evil police, a protest that makes no sense on a variety of levels and is an insult to our troops and the memory of people who fought and died to defend that flag and that anthem. Notice I didn't say those people should be fired, I'm just saying they're morons. Okay, the fact is that according to the Washington Post, this is the Washington Post, okay, not a right-wing source. I try not to use right-wing sources so that people on the left can't accuse me of cherry-picking the data. According to the Washington Post, there have been 721 police shootings this year. Grand total number of black unarmed people shot by the police, nine. Nine. Okay? Notice that is not 50%, that is not 40%, that is not 30%, that is not 10%, that is closer to 1%. Closer to 1%. And just because a perp is not armed, or a, sus or a suspect is not armed, to be more specific, does not mean they didn't try to attack the police. Okay, you count as unarmed if you attack the police with your fists. And if you try to take the gun off the police officer. So the idea that even those nine is, the, is, is all innocent people being shot is not true either. Right? This is why we need to look at each individual case. Instead of just saying that every case is a case of police racism, we actually need the evidence in each individual case. If you show me a case where it looks like a racist shooting, for example, the shooting of Walter Scott in South Carolina, where a white officer shoots a black, uh, a black guy in the back, you know, if that happens, then you're talking about something that we can all get behind. But if you're talking about Darren Wilson shooting Michael Brown, absolutely not. That is not a racist shooting. And to, to do as President Obama did and pretend that rioting in Ferguson is somehow justified by a good police shooting, even according to witness testimony of, a, of black witnesses in Ferguson, Missouri, is absurd. <coughs> Hey, here's, the, here's the bottom line statistic here. Police are 18.5 times more likely to be shot by a black male than an unarmed black male is to be killed and uh, shot and killed by the police. Sorry, we've got to fix the mic here. All righty. Is it back on or I'm just rolling? Keep rolling? Okay, keep rolling. All right, fine. Okay, if you, are, if you are a woman in the United States, you are also not a victim. Okay, this notion that women all over the United States are being raped and fired and brutalized and it's just like the Taliban and, and Donald Trump is somehow a, a, a peculiarly 
you know, a, a peculiarly anti-woman force in legislation. All this is nonsense. Okay, here, here's, here's the actual reality. First of all, let's start with the college rape statistics, because this is a big one on college campuses. There's this weird idea that's been floating around, promulgated by people in the Democratic Party, that one out of five women on a college campus is raped every year. Okay, um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I can suggest, oh, there we go, okay, good. Uh, but I can suggest that this statistic is absolute, absolute hogwash. The statistic has no merit, the idea that one in five women on college campuses has been sexually assaulted or raped. Number one, if your parents, Women in the audience, if your parents sent you to a campus where you had a one in five chance of being raped, you should sue them for child endangerment. <laughs> here are the actual statistics. This is from the Bureau of Justice Department statistics, the Bureau of Justice statistics. Okay, here you go. College students are far less likely to be raped or sexually assaulted than their non-college peers. College campuses, in other words, are safer than a woman of the same age who's outside a college campus. Approximately 6.1 rapes per 1,000 females aged 18 to 24 on college campuses were reported by the BJS from 1997 to 2013. Okay, again, that's 6.1 in 1,000. What we are told by the media, what we are told by folks on the left, is that that, that number is somewhere between 200 and 250 out of 1,000. The actual statistic is six. Okay, that is not a college rape epidemic. And by the way, this is not making light of rape. As I always say, rapists should be castrated, imprisoned for life, or killed. <laughs> How about this bizarre notion that women across the country are being victimized in their jobs, that they're not being paid enough? Okay, again, the statistics do not bear this out. There is no more debunked statistic in America today than the 73 cents on the dollar statistic. It is comparing apples and oranges. Men work different jobs, they work different hours, they have different lifestyles, they get different educational degrees. The idea that everybody is in the same jobs and women are just being paid less is not true. It's just not true. Okay, in fact, Time Magazine reported in 2010 that in 147 out of 150 of the biggest cities in America, women make 8% more than men in their peer groups when they get out of college and don't have kids. More, okay? Women like to spend less time in the workforce because they like to have babies. This is not controversial, and this is not insulting. It's great that women like to have babies. If women didn't like to have babies, there would be no future generations. It is, I'm, I'm constant. I have to say, as a father of two, under four, and my wife is a doctor, so she's a very high-achieving woman, right? She's in res medical residency right now. This idea that women should somehow not like having babies or we have to make fun of them for being homemakers or it's a bad thing or they're not fulfilling their destinies by having babies, it's tripe. It's tripe. I mean, and it is also tripe that men and women spend this, should or want to spend the same amount of time out of the workforce taking care of babies. It's just not the reality. It's not the reality. When my wife had our first kid, she took off a year. When we had our first kid, I took off three days. Okay, that's not unusual. That's not unusual, and it makes some sense. I mean, I don't have to nurse the kid. Right? She, had to, she had to nurse the baby, and guess what? She liked it. She was sad when she went back to work. Now, it's anecdotal, but the fact is that every study ever done shows that women want to take more time off from work than men do. When my wife finishes working, she may want to work part-time. I don't want to work part-time. Okay, that's very typical. Men like working different hours. Men work more hours. If a woman has a choice, on average, between going to an activity that involves her child and working the extra three hours at the office to get those billables up, the woman will, work, will, will, will go hang out with the child. Okay, that's not a slur, it's not a slander. Ver sociological data show this. Okay, this is what the data show. That's not a bad thing, it's a wonderful thing. Men and women are not the same. Men and women are different. These are things we should celebrate. Women have a superpower. They get to create other humans. That's an incredible thing. Why are we ripping on this? Okay, how about the notion across the country that LGBT people are being persecuted across the country, that they are living just a horrific lifestyle in fear for their lives above somebody's attic like Anne Frank? Okay, this is not true either. Women in lesbian couples make far more money than women in straight couples. Men in gay couples make slightly less money than men in straight couples, but same-sex couples with both partners in the labor force make $8,000 more per year on average than straight couples. They're also typically higher educated. As far as the notion that, that hate crime statistics show this wild upsurge in the amounts of hate crime against gay people, the hate crime statistics also tend to show that there's a huge amount of hate crime, for whatever hate crime is defined as, against Jews. This is the greatest country in world history for Jews. 
Okay, the statistics show that the rates are actually pretty similar for hate crimes against gay people. No, every single hate crime should be prosecuted against a gay person. Every single one of them. Just as they should against Jews or black people or anybody else. But this idea that gay people are walking around living in brutal fear in America today, it's just not the reality. It's just not the reality. And by the way, as for the notion that you're a victim, in any sense, because you walk into a place and you say, I want you to cater my same-sex wedding, and therefore you're victimized by American society, if the religious store owner says no, you're not a victim because that person has no, has no duty to serve you. Just as the, the gay baker has no duty to serve the Westboro Baptist Church annual function. Okay, it's a free country. You get to serve whoever you are. And guess what? Guess what? If someone discriminates against you, there's another bakery right across the street. Take your business there, and you can put the other bakery out of business. This is not difficult. And there's this great myth that, that flies around in left-wing circles that if, if it hadn't been for the federal government, discrimination never would have ended on the private level in the United States. That's not true. You know what kept discrimination in place on the private level in the United States? Government. Jim Crow was a system of law. Jim Crow was a system of law in places like Alabama and South Carolina and Mississippi where they legitimately prosecuted businesses, put them in jail for desegregating. That's what kept segregation in place. Markets free people from discrimination because the only color that matters is green. there's this notion in America that if you're poor, that you're a victim in American society. This is the Bernie Sanders stupidity, that there's the 1% versus the 99%, and everyone in the 1% is taking advantage of all the people in the 99%, and please, where did I put my pudding? <laughs> and this, again, the statistics do not bear this out. The idea that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer ignores how statistics work. People in the top 1% 10 years ago are not in the top 1% now. People in the top 1% now may not be in the top 1% in the future. Your income is going to change year to year. Some of you, many of you, will eventually be in the top 1%. You aren't right now. Are you a one percenter or no? You're not, right now, you're not, because you're not, right? I mean, the bottom line is, 1% just measures the level of income. It doesn't follow the people who are in the top 1%. People move up and down on the income scale. Right now, you have no money because you're broke college students spending all your money on pot. But in the future... <laughs> But in the future, you will presumably be the heads of companies, God help us, and then you will be providing goods and services to the rest of us that earn you lots of money and good for you. And this idea that you are somehow hurting people by earning money in a free market system is insane. Okay, Bill Gates has done more to bring the world out of poverty than Mother Teresa did through free market economics. The reason being, he created legitimately tens of thousands of jobs. He made better products for people that made their jobs more efficient. Okay, capitalism brings people out of poverty. Legitimately, half of the world has been brought out of abject poverty by free markets and free trade. In the... In the United States, the upper middle class grew from 12% of Americans in, seven, in 1979 to 30% as of 2014. So this idea of the middle class is falling apart, it's not true. Most of the people in the middle class are now in the upper middle class. Everyone's life is getting better, and if your life is getting better slow, more slowly than Bill Gates, how does that hurt you? Your life is still getting better. If you live next door to Bill Gates, you're still doing fine, even though your house doesn't look like his. Almost 9 in 10 Americans have a standard of living above the global middle-income standard. We're the richest, most prosperous country in the history of the world. And as for the notion that the rich people aren't paying their fair share, again, the statistics do not bear this out. If you are in the top quintile of income earners, you pay, after we take into account the kickbacks that everybody gets from the federal government, the various benefits and checks that are sent to you, if you're on the top quintile of income earners in the United States, you are literally footing the bill for 85% of all non-mandatory federal spending. Okay, if you're in the top 20% of income earners, 85% of net federal revenue is coming from you. The people at the top are paying not some of the taxes, not most of the taxes, but virtually all of the federal income tax in the United States. So this idea that they are somehow screwing everybody else over, I promise you, when people like me sign six-figure checks to the government every year, that I'm not screwing anybody, I'm the one who's getting screwed. Okay? <laughs> so bottom line, for people who find this speech depressing, let me suggest that you need a mind shift. You need to change your worldview. 
This speech should be uplifting because it says that you get to do what you want, which was the basic American promise in the first place. You get to do what you want. And again, as I've said now for the third time, if somebody is victimizing you in a specific way due to, due to racism, sexism, bigotry, then name it, call it out, and we can all be a part of fighting that together. But otherwise, buckle down. Do your work. The way your life is going to get better is by you working harder and working smarter and making smart decisions. Your decisions are the best privilege that you have. The only privilege that matters in the United States is the privilege of making free decisions. We all have that privilege in a free country. Thanks so much. Happy to take your questions.